Uh, Numbers chapter 13, if you would turn your Bibles there, please. Numbers chapter 13. I have um, all the way down to verse 3 on the screen, but I'm going to read uh, the verses from like 4 on down to 16, uh, just for the sake of their names. These are the men who were sent to spy out the land, and we're, we're headed to the promised land. And at this point in the story, at this point, um, they could have walked right in at the end of this chapter. Israel could have been home free by the end of chapter 13 of the book of Numbers. But there was one issue That stood between them. You listen to this. One issue that stood between them. And a life of blessings. In in our case. One thing separates us. Or separates. Excuse me. Anybody. From a. From eternal life. Full of blessings. There's one thing that separates us from what God wants to give us. And we're going to find that out this morning. Chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Now, the land that they're going to get, is it... uh, Something they'll have to pay for? Is it something they'll have to work for? It's something that God's going to do what? Give them. Give means give. Free. Okay? That's what that means. It would be like if you uh, won some kind of sweepstakes... And uh, they said that uh, they were going to give you a brand new, um, oh, give me an expensive SUV, a, a Lincoln, does Lincoln make an SUV? Lincoln Mountaineer, okay. And, they, and you won the contest and so you won the Mountaineer and you go up and claim the prize You take it home, and the next day in the mail, they set you up a payment system for it. Okay, it's only $900 a month for the next eight years. You probably paid less for your house than you did that car. That's not much of a gift, is it? In fact, that's not a gift at all. You just slammed me with a $900 bill. So that's what that means. God, he would have gave it unto them. Which I give unto the children of Israel of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one, a ruler among them. Look at verse 3. Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. And all those men were heads of the children of Israel. We're going to read their names just for history's sake. Memorial sake. These were the names of the tribe. Uh, 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 these were their names of the tribe of Reuben, Shammuah, the son of uh, the son of Z- Zakur, of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of the tribe of Issachar, Egal, the son of Joseph, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshia, the son of Nun. And who is Oshia? It is Joshua. We'll find that out. And so, verse 9, of the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu. Verse 10, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi. Uh, Verse 11, of the tribe of Joseph, namely of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi. Of the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gemali. 
Verse 13 of the tribe of Asher. Sether, the son of M Michael. Verse 14 of the tribe of Naphtali. Nabi, the son of Vosphsi. Verse 15 of the tribe of Gad. Geuel, the son of Mekai. Aren't you glad you don't have to say all these names right to get to heaven? Amen. Amen. It's not a spelling contest or a pronunciation contest. These are the names of the men, verse 16, which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. Jehoshua. Or it will end up being Joshua. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody, I don't care how many people follow them on the internet, anybody who believes this, the people that follow them are stupid. Don't let anybody tell you that you must pronounce the name of Jesus the correct Hebrew way in order for God to hear your prayers. Because if you don't pray in the name of Yeheshua, or no, wait a minute, it's Yehoshua, or Jeshua, or Yeshua. They, they don't even agree, they don't agree as to what the name is. Then the same thing with God. You cannot say God. God is a pagan term. No, it isn't. Uh, or the Lord. You can't call him the Lord. The Lord is what Baal means. Not. He's the Lord. Amen. King of kings and Lord of. He's the Lord. Don't let anybody con you into those beliefs. Into believing that you must say these names the correct Hebrew way. God did not give me a Hebrew tongue. He gave me an English mother, an English father. In fact, worse than that, it's Arkansas English. It means never is sp spelled right. And it means some of the vowels are just drawn way out there. But, yeah, and it's, it gave me an English Bible. Gave me an English congregation and God hears my prayers when I pray them in English. There you go. All right. Now, notice this. In fact, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word. Lord, open our eyes to it. Help us to see what you want us to see. Lord, we need this today. And I pray that you'd bless it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Now, they went... For the specific reason of looking at the land that God was going to give them. And God was absolutely going to give them a show. Uh, when I got married, 1987 is when I sort of got into construction. Uh, in those days, we didn't really see... Uh, those early days, we didn't really see a lot of uh, houses that had just been built whereby they had hired somebody to come in and put all the furniture in it and all the dresser drawers and artwork and all the walls and just and make it look like somebody's living there. Uh, they call that a uh, like a staging company. But nowadays, if they want to sell a house and nobody's living in it, They'll put every stick of furniture that they can think of inside that house and make it look like a lived-in house. Uh, and th then people can get an idea of what it's going to look like. They want to make it look nice so they can sell it, sell it for a high price. Well, God is going to really show these 12 men that he wasn't kidding about this land. This land is a land that floweth with milk and with honey. And the, even though they see giants there, don't worry about that. Uh, I'm going to show you some things that will absolutely make you want this place. Some people say, well, I, I'm an atheist or I'm an agnostic, but if you can show me heaven, I'll believe in it. Listen, I can read about heaven in the Bible and that's all I can see of it, but that's enough for me to want to go. Amen. I can read about hell in the Bible. I never want to see hell. And that's as far as I want to know. And I need to know to know that I don't want to go to hell. Somebody say amen. 
So I don't need a picture of either one to get it right on which one I want to go to. So the Bible says then in uh, verse 17, that Moses sent them out to spy or spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, get ye up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be uh, strong or weak. Uh, this is uh, verse 18. I have that up on the screen, I think. Yeah, I do. Uh, and uh, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And this matters because what God intends to do is kill out all the people that live inside these, what must be a, a beautiful, beautiful homes. He's going to kill out all the people out of them. And he's just going to give the Jews their, these homes. They're just going to get to, when they get to a city, and if that city's been divided off, and let's say that this area belongs to Gad, the tribe of Gad, that whatever city people end up living in, they pick their own house. And if you, I guess if you're, Quick enough, you can get inside the city and, and, and find the best looking house in town and, and say, this is my house and it'll be your house. What did Jesus say? In my father's house are what? Many mansions. And when I saw, oh, I would have told you so. And I, I just can't even imagine what God's mountain, mansions look like. But I know they gotta be really something. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, let's see here. Verse 20. Uh, what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. And keep that in mind. Now, in verse 21. So they went up and searched the land for the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob as men come to Hamath and they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron where Ahimon, Shishai and Talmai, the children of Anak were there were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Let me stop right here. Who is Anak? A-N-A-K. Huh? He is a very prominent giant. Especially in the Bible. His name is mentioned several times. He is a man of prominence. He is a king, uh, uh, presumably. Um, the idea being when you're 15 feet tall, and yeah, I said 15. We know that the bed of Og was over 13 feet. Okay, using 18 inch cubit. So the person, Anak, could have very well been between 13, 15 feet, maybe more. And again, we're not just talking about long skinny legs. We're talking about girth. These guys were very muscular, very muscular. And so, um, as they hear the name Anak, and they see uh, these three men that are his sons, they know that Anak is, must be a powerful king. I mean, literally, when you're that big, what I was trying to say a while ago was when you're that big and you're that strong, uh, if you play king of the world, you're going to win king of the world. Okay? Nobody's going to be able to beat you at anything, including chess. Even if you're just dumb as a box of rocks, if you start to lose at chess, you can beat the other guy up, you win. Okay? Uh, but anyway... So that's who Anak is and his three sons mentioned by name, Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak were. 
That's in verse 22. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Verse 23. And they came unto the brook of Eskol. And they cut down from thence a branch. But you pay attention to the language of your Bible now. What is a branch in the Bible? Who does that signify? Yeah. If you look in Isaiah chapter 11. In fact, turn there. I don't have this in my notes. I'm going, out, I'm going outside of my notes. Uh-oh. Isaiah 11 verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch. Capital B. Shall grow out of his roots. Uh, Jesus said in John 15. I'm the vine. You're the branches. Uh, he that abideth in me, um, let me read that the way it is, because I don't want to mess it up. John chapter 15, turn there. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring uh, forth more fruit. And understand something. That I learned years ago. And it, it literally relieved me of a lot of pressure that I had put on myself. It is not up to me to produce the fruit. I'm not able to do it. I'm not able to just at a snap of a finger love people that I'm really, really mad at. I'm not able to do that. God is able to do that in me and cause me to exhibit love whereas before I would not exhibit love toward a certain person or certain people, whatever. I wouldn't do it. But when God puts it in you, it will come out. Amen. That's what God, that's what he, amen. Because he causes us to bear the fruit. Don't worry. You will love people. You will have peace. You will have joy. You will have long suffering. You will have faith. Don't worry about it. God's going to give it to you in his time and in his way. It'll show up on these days coming out of you so thick and rich. You won't be able to stop it. Amen. Amen. All right. Back to uh, numbers. So they have this branch and it only has one cluster of grapes, just one. Not like that, maybe. Mm -mm. You keep reading. They came under the brook Eskel and cut it down, cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. It was so big that two men running a, a, a thick enough branch, a limb of some kind, a rod of some kind, running it through there in that, in that cluster to, so that two of them could carry it on their shoulders. How much would that have to weigh in order for one man not to be able to carry it on his own? Huh? Couple hundred pounds? The Bible's very clear to tell you that it's only one cluster. And yet it weighs at least in excess of a hundred pounds. Bare minimum of that. I cannot imagine. I know I've never seen anything like that. Each grape, I don't know how big they must have been, but they must have been huge. And so they bring out the branch with one cluster of grapes. They bear it between two upon a staff. And they, br and they brought of the pomegranates. And of the figs, and I love figs. 
But figs don't love me because they're full of sugar. Oh, my people had a fig tree. He had a fig tree and I used to love going down there, Gary, if them figs was ripe, he would take me out to his fig tree and we'd just pick them, pick them right off the tree or if they were on the ground, but they hadn't been smushed too much, then we'd get them up off the ground, amen? Flick an ant off of it and eat it, amen? Amen, listen, I was a kid, I didn't care, amen? But anyway, I love figs and the place was called the brook, of e the brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. What does the number 40 signify? Well, it signifies generally in the Bible a time of, of, uh, of like uh, probation or a time of testing. You have the uh, 40 days that the, uh, the, uh, the, the, where the clouds brought forth the rain and the, and the, uh, the, the fountains of the deep uh, rose up and the, the rains came down and the floods came up. That's what I'm trying to say. And uh, they all came down for 40 days. And that number four teaches us that it's the gospel. This is a gospel message, a gospel idea, a gospel understanding. That it has in mind that of spirits, a spiritual understanding, a spiritual meeting. Uh, 40 days, Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days. And how much did, how many figs did Moses eat in those 40 days? Didn't eat nothing. Bible says he didn't even drink for 40 days. That's supernatural. God does that. Um, then he went up and did it again after he broke the first set of the, the uh, Ten Commandments. But anyway, 40, Jesus uh, was uh, weakened in his body. By not eating, he was in the wilderness for 40 days. And I always like to bring this analogy. When Eve was tempted by the devil, uh, she wasn't hungry. But she didn't have to be. She had the whole garden to herself. She could eat whatever it was in the garden. Whatever she wanted, she could eat. She could eat what she wanted. She could drink what she wanted. She had everything that would make her belly full and, and give her the, the fruit of God's beautiful garden. In fact, there might even be some, uh, some of them good tomatoes in there on the vine or some of those, uh, Vidalia onions. Who like Vidalia onions? Sweet. You can eat them like an apple. Amen. Oh my goodness. But anyway, uh, she had all food, all kinds of food. And when the devil tempted her, it wasn't that she needed to eat something. She just did it. Here the devil comes to Jesus and he hasn't eaten a bite in 40 days. And he hasn't drank anything for 40 days. And the devil tempts him and says, turn these stones to bread. Who remembers the USA for Africa deal, the, the song, We Are the World, We Are the Children? Who remembers that? You know what the lyrics were? I think Willie Nelson sang this part. He said, as God has shown us by turning stones to bread. God did not turn stones to bread. The devil tempted Jesus to turn stones to bread. I don't know if you ever, that's old history. That's 40, 40, 50, something like that years. But anyway, it's a long, been a long time. But that's the part of the delusion. Okay. But anyway, Jesus was hungry. And he could have made any kind of bread or biscuit that he wanted. But he didn't. Amen. It's just a good lesson there. All right. So it's. A time of testing. and But it has to do with the gospel. Because when this story is taught in the New Testament. Specifically in the book of Hebrews. When this story is taught by the Apostle Paul. He says some of them didn't believe. And he said those who didn't believe. God made them wander in the wilderness. Until they fell dead. And why? Unbelief. 
unbelief. What did I say? I said something a while ago that there's one thing that may be holding you back from trusting God about something. Maybe about going to heaven. And that would be unbelief. You think, surely, God wouldn't just give somebody who's been a wicked, nasty, dirty, filthy sinner all their life. Surely God wouldn't give somebody like that eternal life and eternal joy. He will if they ask. He will if they ask. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the gospel. That is the one gospel verse right there. If you want to tie the gospel down to one verse, it's always John 3, 16. Because it says it all. Amen. Now, let's, let's go back a little bit to this cluster. What, what does this cluster of grapes represent? Uh, that's a photograph that they dug up with the Dead Sea Scrolls. No, I'm just kidding. But I would say that the grapes probably were even larger than that. I would think they were larger than that. That, th I think, could be carried by one man, but I think they were much larger. Turn to Isaiah 65 and, and just kind of underline this in your Bible and make a note on it. Okay? We're just doing a little Bible study this morning is what we're doing. Doing an old Bethel Bible study. Isaiah 65, verse 8. Isaiah 65, 66 is getting into the time of the end. Yeah, there we go. Isaiah 65. Look at verse 1. It's talking about us. I am sought of them that ask not for me, and I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. He's referring to the Gentiles here. We are the people who are not called by the name of the Lord. We're just Gentiles. We're heathens. And yet, the people who didn't seek for God are now seeking for God. And that's us. Uh, in verse 2, he said, I spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Now, let's look down in verse, um, look at verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, God's always got a blessing ready. And he said, thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sakes that I may not destroy them all. Now, what is new wine? New wine is wine that has not been fermented. It is unfermented. And, I'm, and the word wine is, as far as the King James, is, is a universal usage. You must look at the context to see whether or not it's referring to alcoholic wine or non-alcoholic wine. And in this case, it would be, since it's new wine, it is non-alcoholic. The, um, the, when Pharaoh had the dream of his cupbearer lifting his cup up, and taking a fresh cluster of grapes and squeezing it into Pharaoh's cup and then handing it to Pharaoh. It, what kind of wine is he giving him? New wine, unfermented wine. And the fermentation, watch this now, yeast 
is leaven, and leaven in the Bible is a type of sin or false doctrine. See, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump, won't it? And let me give you an, another example of this. In John chapter 1, verse 1, the Jehovah's Witness can absolutely destroy your faith in Jesus Christ by one little bitty letter. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's how it says in the King James, and so on. All they have to do is add the letter A. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was A, God. And that destroys the entire doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ. He is not God. He is a God. Which basically means one of the lesser created beings of God. That, that little bit of leaven leavens the entire lump of their belief system, doesn't it? So you be careful about the leaven. And when you add leaven to uh, orange juice, apple juice, grape juice, pomegranate juice, I don't know where, all, uh, uh, corn juice. Amen. What do you got after that? Yeah. A five-year prison sentence. Okay. <laughs> That's what it does. The, the leaven eats the sweetness, the sugar, out of the wine or out of whatever it is you got. It eats the sweetness up of it and pukes out uh, alcohol. So you're eating leaven puke. Okay? And it messes your mind up. I could preach a whole sermon on that. Don't, don't get me started today. But he said, as the new wine is, in, is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants, that I may not destroy them all. God does, is not interested in destroying all Israel. He knows there's some going to turn to him. He knows that some are going to turn to salvation. He knows that. So he has reserved a cluster for them. And I want you to think about this now. That one cluster that they brought in from Eskol, that brook, brought it into the camp of the Israelites with two men carrying it. One guy's name was Old Testament. The other guy's name was New Testament. And both men were bringing in the branch. Amen. And they were bringing in the new wine because it was in the cluster. Amen. Do you see the, 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 uh, the beauty of this passage now? This is God delivering His Word to Israel. There's a blessing. There's a promise. And there's a wonder inside that cluster because it's got new wine in it. Which is a picture of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Drink the new wine, not that old stuff, not the stuff that they ran out of at that bridal party in, John, in the Gospel of John. Jesus made new wine, amen. The sweet stuff, the good stuff that didn't make them drunk. I cannot, I cannot fathom in my mind Jesus making Mogan David. Or just a case of hooch. I can't picture that in my mind. Amen. Jesus wasn't going to drink it. He, his mom wasn't going to drink it. And he wouldn't make anybody else drink it either. He made new wine. And so new wine represents the blessing of the gospel. In Joel chapter 1. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten. That which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. There's, by the way, there's four types of worms on here. Palmer worm, locust, canker worm, caterpillar. He says in verse 5, Awake ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. You know what God is saying here? You're not going to get the new... I'm not going to give you the new wine. I'm not going to let you have it. All you want to do is get drunk... That's what's going to happen. 
And he said, A nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. And he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. That is an identical match to the army that comes up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 9. They are without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. Again, four things. The branches thereof are made white. God is going to take away from his people the new wine so that they cannot drink of it, sober up, and think with a sober mind concerning the scriptures. Right now, there is a spirit of drunkenness on all of Israel. They are drunk, not with wine. They are uh, they stumble, but not because of strong drink. It's because God put a spirit in them. In Joel chapter 1 verse 8, Lament like a virgin, gird, girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest, the Lord's minister is born. The field is wasted. The land mourneth for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, how ye vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because of the harvest of the field, is perished. Now, all of this, because people decided not to believe God. You see, these twelve men came back. They told the story of the giants. They told the story of, uh, of what they saw there. They said the walls, man, the walls are amazing. Uh, if you want to look this up, look for a city in Lebanon called Baalbek. Baalbek. B-A-A-L-B-E-K. -A -A it has, it's got a, a, a portion of a wall that was built by two different people. The foundation of the wall was put down by people who history doesn't record who it was. But they put out two layers. The, each individual stone weighs in excess of thousands of tons. Lying next to it is the largest quarried stone to ever be found on planet earth it's just lying there like it was meant to be put in place but something happened to the people that could put it in place you can stand shoulder to shoulder about a hundred or so people the length of this stone that's how long it is men did not quarry stone like this giants did okay living proof that giants were real. And that's what I believe the Israelite, the 12 spies saw when they was looking at those cities. They saw those incredibly huge walls that were built out of stones that they're going, how in the world? But then they found out that Anak's sons were there and that they were reigning. Now Anak's sons are not going to be my size uh, they're not going to be Jerry's size. They're not going to be small people or tall, like, like me or whatever. They're going to be huge like daddy was. And they're going to be about 13, 12, 13 feet tall. And uh, so they just shuddered with fear. When they came back after 40 days, they told the Israelites, Oh, listen, yeah, we found out everything that God said about that land was true. I mean, there's waters out there. There's wood out there. There's fields out there for our cattle. Everything to make us a wealthy nation. Everything is there. The milk, the honey. It's all there. You see here the, the grapes. I mean, imagine. Imagine now a vineyard full. Because grapes like that don't grow necessarily wild. They are a cultivated crop. Am I right, John? Okay. They are a man-cultivated crop. And in order to get them as pretty as they are at the supermarket, you can't just go out in the woods and pick them up off the ground. 
Imagine vineyards where you see nothing but clusters this big or bigger. And they come back telling that story and then they came back and they said, uh, however, in fact, turn to Isaiah 13, or excuse me, Numbers 13. I want you to see this. For those of you who somebody has asked you, well, I just don't believe the Bible. I don't believe God uh, is in that because God killed a lot of innocent people. He told Joshua to kill a lot of innocent people. He told Moses to kill a lot of innocent people. And I don't think God would do that. Do I sound like somebody you know? Thank you. Um, God told him to kill every one of these people. And there's a reason why. Um, let's look at verse 28. Nevertheless, uh-oh. Yeah. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. That's telling you that the, the wall at Baalbek probably is nothing compared to the walls that the giants built in the Canaan land. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites of the Jebusites or and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Now Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are able to overcome it. Um, yeah, it's up on the screen. We're, a, we're able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. Now, I've been preaching about... Um, different addictions... And the fact that you can't quit. The reason why is they are stronger than you. They are stronger than you. I met a guy several years ago that we went to high school with. In fact, he lived in our neighborhood. And I thought this guy was was the coolest guy I ever met. And I was a little dork, twerp, kid, annoying kid. And um, so I looked up to him. I wanted to be like him. He came, here, came to church here a little while and he showed me his ankle bracelet, monitor, his GPS monitor. He was out on probation and he volunteered the information. He said that he had been put in prison for manufacturing and distributing meth. And he said, let me tell you something about meth. He said, after the first hit, you never don't want it. You always want it. And... Uh, he said, I can tell you that God has delivered me from it because I don't have the desire for it. And I've heard that from other people. But for the most part, meth, you never want, you never want to start the first one. You never do. Because I guarantee you, you will have no strength against it. Some people, it's alcohol. They, one drink, and they have no strength against it whatsoever. Others, it's one thing. Others, it's another. It's all kinds of things that we get hooked on, things that we get locked into, things that we get um, addicted to. And that's what, that's what God, that's what these, these men are saying. When they came back and they gave the report, the Bible says the evil report. They basically said, we, we are not, 
we're not able to go in there. We can't do it. And the truth of it is, you're right, you can't. But when uh, Caleb starts talking here, and he says in verse 30, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are, able to, we are well able to overcome it. He knows that it's not going to be by their strength. He knows it's going to be by God's strength. And so he says um, uh, in verse uh, 31, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and, and all the people. Listen, to, look, at verse, look at verse 32. All the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. How many men were of great stature? All of them. The Bible says so. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants and people, and, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Now I'm going to stop right here, but I'm going to tell you something. God deliberately put you up against an adversary that you are not strong enough to overcome. Because if you could, you wouldn't need God. You wouldn't need God. You wouldn't call upon the Lord. If you could save yourself, what do we need Jesus for? If you, through your own effort and, oh, Anthony Robbins, he's got a new, uh, he's got a new video out now. And, and uh, for $495, I get this video and I get a little workbook to go with it. And uh, when I get done with that, I can conquer uh, all of my uh, uh, all of my problems, I can conquer my addictions, I can conquer this, I can conquer that, because Anthony Robbins said so. Anthony Robbins is glad to be making 500 bucks off you. Because I'm telling you, it doesn't cost that much to make DVDs anymore, does it? We know how much it costs. It don't cost very much at all. It don't cost all that much to have a website either. You put it up on the web. Doesn't cost all that much at all. He's making a ton of money off this stuff. And still people are addicted. Still people uh, want to go back to it. They all want to go back. These men, uh, at the end, when we get into Numbers 14, you will find out that they, once again, they said, let us make us a captain and we'll turn around. We'll go back to Egypt. What are you, nuts? Are you crazy? But that's, that's what they said. And so God said, fine, you're going to walk in a circle for 40 years until you all die. But I'm not going to let you in the promised land. Only Joshua, only Caleb, out of, out of those who came out of Egypt, they're the only ones who got to go in the promised land. And that's something, only two. And when it comes to the goals of your life, when it comes to you wanting to go to heaven, when it comes to the things that have you tied down and they have overcome you and you have tried and you have cried tears to God and you've said, God, I keep trying. God, I try hard. God, I just, I can't do it. God, I can't do it. God, don't give up on me, please. But God, I can't do it. I can't. And God says, I know. I made it that way. Because when I finally get ready, how you doing? God says, when I finally get ready to make you free, you'll know that it wasn't you that did it. You'll know it was me. And then everybody that knows you will know that it wasn't you, that it was me. And I look in this church right now and I see people that 
I know that what the change that took place was God's change and it wasn't yours. And he still does it. And he'll continue to do it. Whatever it is, no matter how difficult, no matter how hard, I promise you, God, God has an interest in seeing you up in heaven. He's invited the, the people that he wanted there and they're not showing up. So he went out and compelled his servants to go out into the highways and, and hedges and said, beat the bushes and go to the barns, get them, wake them up out of, the, out of the hog pens and tell them to come in here. We're having us a wedding party. And by the way, they're the bride, amen. Don't give up on God. And don't call God a liar by saying, I don't think God can make this better. I don't think God can fix this problem. Don't say that. And don't believe it. Because if you do, the devil has won. And I don't want him to have another thing out of my life. Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the word today. What a beautiful story. That, that branch, that cluster of grapes, the, the be there's, there's a blessing in it. It's the blessing and the promises of your word and of your spirit. And they, it's the new wine that comes to us from the throne of God. Giving us the sweetness and the fatness. The goodness of the grapes. And of the figs and of the pomegranates. And Lord, we thank you for all the good and the sweet things that you have put in this world that we enjoy, Father, with, uh, with our flesh. We enjoy it with the body that we have now. But Father, lest that wine turn from a blessing to a curse, and it becomes wine that people get stuck on. People get hooked on. They can't shake it. They can't step away from it by themselves. They just can't do it. Father, for those, Lord, that have already fallen in. So I pray, dear God, that you would deliver them. Bring them out of it, God. Because only you can do it. And I pray, dear God, that. Lord, that you would teach people out of your word. Show them great and mighty things that they know not. Show them, Father, why that it has taken so long or why you tarry. Because, Father, we wonder that. Why do you tarry? Why do you wait? But one of these days, your coming is going to be there and it's going to be real. And we will have given you the praise and the glory. For being such a good God to us. Father I pray dear God that. Wherever this message is heard today. God that you would change somebody's life. God that you would. Uh, remedy somebody's. Broken life. Father that you would. Um, uh, you would give them healing. From the wounds of sin. And God that you would make. What's in the, the branch and what's in the uh, cluster. God, that you would make it a blessing for all of those who come to you in spirit and in truth. And Father, just bless us with your word today. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our God. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Stand to your feet.